That's right. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this is uh, this is your I call it your host Tom Mumley, and I have the privilege of uh, moderating this last session, which we titled "General Topics." But it these are uh, a group of most excellent topics, as you can see from the agenda. We'll start with an uh, update on contaminants in bay fish from Jay Davis from, from the Institute. And we uh, recently completed a, a recurrent round of, of contaminants and fish monitoring, something we do on a regular basis. And we, just, we have an updated report, which Jay will present on. And then we're gonna, then we're gonna do something of interest is talk about other monitoring programs in the Bay Area that uh, would are interrelated or of interest to those of us in the RNP family, led by Kevin Lundy from the Bay Board. And uh, something unique about that would be an interactive aspect, which I'll introduce before uh, Kevin starts talking. Then we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Ann Cooper Doherty from the Department of Toxic Substance Control to give a brief presentation on the TSC's Safer Consumer Products Program. For those of you who, who may not know enough about that or know much about that and that will help uh, uh, make her presence in the last panel more more relevant and obvious where we have a panelist of of representatives of the various uh, uh, rmp funding sectors and as well as ann Cooperts to talk about how uh, how RMP data has been used for management decisions of interest to them, additional interest that they have, and, and the like, an opportunity, hopefully, for those of you in the audience to ask some questions. So, with that general background, I'm going to uh, introduce Jay. Um, you know, and most everybody knows who Jay is, but his involvement in, in this work goes back a few years. He made note in his bio that I'm checking that. He started basically in 1987, and he can cross-reference working with me back then because I, uh, the role I was playing at the water board, I made available to Jay hard copies of discharger effluent data, like from the petroleum refineries and others, as he was working on on a report of contaminant loading to the bay, and uh, after working at the at the institute. Or back then, the aquatic science, I mean, the aquatic science, uh, what, yeah, we worked at this too for a while. He, he went off and got his PhD and then came back to the RMP and where and that he's been serving as the lead scientist for the regional monitoring program since 2008. Uh, he also plays a key role in the state statewide fish monitoring program. So, Jay, it got uh, entered. Tell us about contaminants in bay fish, please. Um, great to be here with you all virtually for, for another annual meeting. It's great to see some of the old old uh, names in the participant list and a lot of new names. And um, one name in particular I'm happy to see is Karen Taberski. Um, one of my first major assignments when I joined the RMP uh, staff back in 1995, way back, was to work with Karen from the water board to incorporate fish monitoring into the RMP. Karen had led the first ever baywide study of contaminants in fish in the bay in 1994 as part of the Bay Protection, Protection and Toxic Cleanup Program. We began planning in 1996 and in 1997, the RMP began monitoring with a basic design that has remained in place over the last 24 years. Um, back in 1995, if someone told me where we would be in 2021 in terms of contamination of bay fish, I would have been pretty unpleasantly surprised. And I'm gonna show you why by providing a summary of the, the new report on contaminants in fish um, uh, that we, collected in 2019. Next slide, thanks. <laughs> um, so why do we care about contaminants in fish? Um, it's really a crucial indicator of bay water quality and has become more and more, uh, go back one slide, more and more uh, a focus 
um, of tracking water quality in the Bay. Um, one of the, the main goals of the Clean Water Act is for U.S. waters to be fishable, which means healthy fish populations, but also fish that are clean and safe to eat. Um, fish are an important source of food, a uh, so great source of protein and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and the data that the RMP collects support the advisory for the Bay and also TMDL cleanup plans um, uh, for mercury, PCBs, and selenium. Um, in spite of efforts that have been made to date, um, like the ban of PCBs and other management actions, unfortunately, the bay is not entirely fishable, and progress toward that goal has been slow. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, and the main problem is that um, we have contamination by legacy contaminants in mercury and sleet and in, in PCBs in particular in bay sediment, and that's um, slowing our progress towards cleaner fish. Next slide. So I want to start by showing a, a great summary of the, the, the status of fish contamination, contamination in the bay. Um, produced by the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And this is a, a poster that summarizes the advisory for the Bay. And it's an excellent example of RMP data being turned into information. Um, data are just numbers. Information are, 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 is data that's been interpreted and put into a form that can help, help uh, decision making. And this advisory helps the public decide um, how to reduce their exposure to contaminants in fish. Um, so some of the key, key points about uh, contaminants in bay fish, um, there's uh, varying levels of concern for different parts of the human population. The, the, the greatest concern is for children and women of childbearing age because mercury in particular is more toxic to, to uh, fetuses and children. Um, so this poster is focused on that sensitive population, and it lays out um, the it, you know, it advice for the numbers of servings per week that, that can be consumed um, by the sensitive population. And uh, the, the fish are laid out um, starting at the bottom, the fish with the highest contaminant concentrations that are in the do not eat category. And unfortunately, we have a few of those. Uh, in the bay, including striped bass, surf perches, and white sturgeon, um, some of the popular species uh, for fishing. Um, these are also species that we focus on in our monitoring, the key indicator species. Um, other species like halibut and white croaker are less contaminated and can be consumed at one serving per week. And then at, in the cleaner category, we have Salmon and jack smelt is a couple of examples. Um, jack smelt is another one of the, the monitoring species that we focus on. Um, so this is a kind of an introduction to the cast of characters that I'm going to be showing data for. Next slide. So um, as uh, for water quality in general, the Bay has one of the, the best fish contamination monitoring programs anywhere. It's um, certainly, um, there's none better in California and, uh, and um, in, in terms of how thorough it is and, uh, and how we sustained it over time. Um, this is the eighth round that um, we're reporting on uh, that, uh, of sampling that was done in 2019. Um, we're currently sampling on a five-year cycle. Um, we, sent, we collected fish in 2019 at 13 locations. Um, shown on the map, there's a, a mixture of stations that we typically uh, sample for status and trends, but then we had added to that with a special study on PCBs in 2019. And five of the stations I'll be showing the most data for are stations that we've monitored since, since the very beginning uh, in uh, 2017. We, we um, collected specimens of 16 different species, um, a total of uh, over 1,300 fish. Um, we analyzed them as 152 samples uh, for, for 
for most species, we we combine fish into single samples, uh, um, in an approach called compositing, um, to make our analytical dollars go further. And we've looked at many contaminants. Um, I only I only have time to show data for a few. Um, and you know we have a great program, but there are still gaps, and I'll talk about that at the end of the talk. Next slide. So I want to start by showing mercury data, and our our star species here is striped bass. Um, they accumulate high mercury concentrations due to their position in the food chain, at the top of the food chain. Um, they're also very popular species for consumption in the bay. Um, they tend to move around in the open bay, um, so they're an indicator of conditions kind of in the, out in the, uh, at a regional scale, out including the open bay. Next slide. So I'm going to show some graphs that all have a similar format where I'm showing bars that indicate average concentrations and then the points uh, indicate the individual samples that were analyzed. And I'm starting here with um, the data, the entire data set from mercury and all the species in 2019. And the take home message here is that we have many species with average concentrations well above thresholds. Um, the species are arranged from high concentration to low concentration. And then the, the lines show various thresholds um, uh, that, that are relevant. Um, the, the, the yellow line is um, 0 0.44 parts per million. It's a useful uh, uh, reference line. It's the level at which OEHA um, considers no uh, no consumption advisory. Um, the, the next uh, line is the pink line, which is the, the the water board's water quality objective for the bay of 0 0.2 parts per million. The blue line's a, a lower um, OEHA level for developing uh, advice. Uh, at, so that's that's the level they use to uh, determine or to categorize fish in the two serving per week category. So um, bat rays had the highest average concentration um, and like uh, sharks and rays in general tend to have high levels. We were filling out our data set on bat rays as, uh, uh, on request as, uh, in response to a request by OEHA. They would like to include bat rays in the advice. They're not currently in there yet. The next bar is striped bass. And the average concentration there is just over the 0.44 parts per million level, uh, which is that no consumption threshold. Um, going down, looking at some of the other main popular species uh, with mod sort of intermediate concentrations, white sturgeon, um, shiner surf perch, California halibut are right around that 0.2 part per million water quality objective. And then we go all the way down to uh, species that was another request from a WEHA to fill a data gap, the monkey face prickleback, which had the lowest concentrations. Next slide. Um, another notable point about the bay is that we stand out not only in our monitoring, but we stand out in our, our, our degree of contamination of our fish. Um, this uh, um, graph shows mercury concentrations in striped bass across the U.S. And San Francisco Bay has the highest um, concentrations of mercury in striped bass. Um, New Jersey came in second, but they looked at larger fish and that inflates their value. So San Francisco Bay um, has an unusual amount of mercury contamination in the food web. Next slide. And then, um, unfortunately, we are not seeing any decline in mercury in bay striped bass. And it, um, we have an unusual situation with mercury where we have reliable data from the early 70s. And when you put those data together with the RMP data, um, as done in this graph, there's no evidence of change over this 50 year period. Um, that, uh, that yellow line, the the no consumption threshold, a good reference point. The most recent average again was just above that and 
the average concentrations over the years have fluctuated somewhat you know, above and below that line. Um, but um, over this long period, we've seen no change. So if, uh, if um, you had told me back in 1995 that we would see no change in, in our mercury concentrations in striped bass over this long time period, I would have been pretty surprised. Um, but we think this makes sense. There's been a lot of work done on mercury. We think it's because of mercury in the, in the sediment that's been mixed throughout the bay. And again, these striped bass are connected to the to contamination at a regional level. Um, so, and, and, and unfortunately, this is um, kind of the cat is kind of out of the bag on this. There's not a lot we can do about the mercury that, that is already out in the bay sediment. Next slide. Now on to PCBs, and the key species here is Shiner surf perch. Another, not quite as popular as striped bass, but it's popular for shore-based and pure fishing. Um, in contrast to striped bass, this species has small home ranges, so they're good indicators of local spatial variation. And they also have relatively high fat content in their tissues, and so they accumulate PCBs and other organic chemicals to relatively high concentrations. Next slide. So the status for PCBs in bay fish um, in 2019 is again, the same basic point as for mercury. We have many species with concentrations well above thresholds. Um, Shiner surf perch are at the top. Again, they're going from high to low and the average concentration is over 200 parts per billion and the the no consumption threshold is at 120, so that species is well above the no consumption threshold. The, the water board target um, here is down at the bottom in blue, and that's 10 parts per billion, so we're way above that, that value. Um, and then some of the other species of interest you'll see, like in the middle striped bass, although they're high in mercury, they're not in, in the the margin areas where the shiner surf perch are found and accumulate their PCBs. Out in the open bay, the PCB levels are lower and, and we see that in the striped bass. Um, California halibut, another popular species, again, has lower levels and kind of moderate levels of contamination. And then our cleanest species is, again, the monkey-faced prickleback, which is um, not that helpful because they're very hard to catch. And, not that popular for consumption. Next slide. Um, and like for mercury, the bay stands out with exceptionally high PCB concentrations. Um, this graph shows data from a survey in 2009 and 10 of the entire coast in showing Shiner surf perch data. And there, there are many places where Shiner surf perch have low concentrations, um, but San Francisco Bay really stood out. Um, the only other place that was, was in the same ballpark was San Diego Bay um, with, with uh, high levels. So, so the bay really stands out for PCB contamination as well as mercury. Next slide. And then um, for PCBs, it's not quite as bleak in terms of trends as for mercury. Um, there are some Limited signs of long-term decline for Shiner surf perch. You have to look at the, the data by location because they're so site-specific. Um, and overall, we have seen some, some uh, trends towards lower concentrations, but nothing very clear. And in, if you look at that yellow line, again, as a reference point, the no consumption level, um, some places like Oakland Harbor remain well above that. Um, and uh, you know, overall, looking at data from other species, there are some signs of decline, but very limited. And for PCBs, it's a little different, though. For here, there's been a lot of work done. Um, we think that the contaminated sediment in the bay um, is a, a big factor in leading to this, these, uh, this lack of trend. But we also think there are, that there are continuing inputs that are contributing to this problem. So th this seems like a situation where um, if we can reduce some of those stormwater inputs like we heard about in the last session, that we think that 
these um, these local areas on the margins could respond and um, see improvement. Next slide. Okay, next is PFOS. And here there's not a particular species that stands out as the indicator. It's really a, a suite. Um, next slide. And this, this graph shows the, the data for 2019. Um, and shows species again going down the left and the, the average concentration and the individual values. Um, and all the locations are shown on this graph. So um, we see, and then um, the, the dashed line shows, we don't have a threshold for PCBs in the, I mean, for PFOS in the Bay. Um, OEHA has not established a threshold, nor has the water board. Um, so for as a reference, I'm showing the threshold, a threshold that was developed by New Jersey. Some other states have developed thresholds. Um, their threshold 3.9 parts per billion. And the the levels that we see in the bay, in particular in, in um, fish in the South Bay, um, some, of, some of them exceed that value. And um, um, we had we, the, the data set here is relatively limited, though. We haven't put as much effort into, into sampling PFOS as we have for PCBs and mercury. Next slide. So I see Tom wrapping up. Um, so what's next? Um, the RMP will continue to monitor in 2024. We plan to do a more thorough assessment of PFOS. Um, uh, another Highlight in regards to PFOS and other perfluorinated chemicals, PFASs, is a workshop that we're planning, SFEI is planning in uh, partnership with Clean Water Action and the California Indian Environmental Alliance um, for February 4th, where we're going to have a discussion about PFAS contamination of bay fish and look to build consensus for next steps to protect uh, bay fishers from this contamination and will include representatives of uh, impacted communities. Next slide. And then um, a great and important new direction uh, is moving towards uh, addressing environmental justice concerns with an increased focus on groups with high consumption rates like African Americans, tribes, and other communities. The state um, a couple of years ago, established new beneficial use definitions for tribal and subsistence fishing. And the regional boards are evaluating whether to designate these uses in their regions. Um, also at the state level, um, the state monitoring that I um, lead with, uh, in, uh, with in partnership with Anna Holder and others at the state water board is moving towards community guided monitoring um, where we um, meet with community groups, the, the groups that have potentially high exposure, uh, and find out where they're fishing, what fish they're eating, and monitor those areas to help uh, assess their exposure. This work is starting in the San Diego region, and we're going region by region, working throughout the state. And then lastly, um, uh, the San Francisco Water Board is directing funds um, early next year towards a survey of, of subsistence fishers in the Bay um, to obtain better information on their rates of consumption and evaluate whether the existing thresholds or objectives are protective. Um, this is going to build on a, an eye-opening pilot study that was done by a community group in Vallejo called All Positives Possible, led by LaDonna Williams. This pilot survey gave us a glimpse of what conditions are like in some of the neglected areas of the Bay shoreline, where people who depend upon the Bay the most are likely facing high exposure from Bay fish, along with many other obstacles to their use and enjoyment of the Bay, such as industrial accidents, access, crime, and trash. And then I've got an acknowledgement slide. And then uh, I particularly want to thank EPA for adding to our funding for this. And then for more information, um, I've got a slide with a lot of links and these slides and other slides from today will be posted on the annual meeting webpage so you can um, access this additional information. I'll leave it there. 
All right. Thank you, Jay. We actually are well past here a lot of time, so I'm going to have to move us into the, the next presentation. So, Kevin, you can cue yourself up and I'll, I'll um, set up your talk and, uh, and introduce you. Uh, just for the audience sake, I want, this next presentation is a little bit of a change because there's going to be opportunity for audience participation, or at least those of you in the audience who have familiarity with water quality monitoring programs that merit uh, accounting for by us. And so uh, Kevin will bring, bring that to your attention during his presentation, but that we're gonna ask you to uh, use the Q&A function in Zoom to give us information relative to uh, monitoring programs you're aware of. But the but to kick things off, uh, Kevin Lundy, who actually play, who's played a key role in the current service water ambient monitoring program at the Water Board. He, he actually took the baton from Karen Taberski when she retired. And as Karen, he's done a great job with your, uh, with your uh, mentoring. And Kevin is, Kevin is a senior in our planning division. So he's, he's take, he oversees work developing TMDLs, other basin planning projects, and now uh, in, in overseas, our in-bay navigation dra dra uh, dredging program, in addition to his attention to monitoring. And, uh, and he's Dr. Kevin Lundy. And, and he's been, as I like the fact that he's got his PhD from UC Berkeley. So we say go bears here as well as go giants. So Kevin, uh, all yours. Thank you, Tom. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I hope this beautiful photo of Butteau Creek <clears throat> will lure you away from any telework distractions uh, that might be happening on your end. So as Tom said, my talk is gonna cover the important connections between the Bay RMP that you uh, heard about so much today and the many other Bay, Creek or watershed, even nationwide monitoring programs that sample in our Bay area. So today's talk will have three main sections. Uh, the first is an overview of our surface water ambient monitoring program known as SWAMP, which is housed in our regional water board office. Uh, the second part of the talk is to mention some of the major monitoring programs uh, that happen all the way from the ocean to the San Francisco Bay proper, to Bay wetlands, and then up into the watersheds draining into these habitats. And for the last portion of my talk, I'm asking for your input on what projects or programs are sampling that really should be on our radar as we synthesize data across these broad spatial areas. So SFEI will then use this information to create a map of all these programs. Over the last 20 years, SWAMP has collected and analyzed a plethora of data shown on this map. SWAMP's mission is to collect high quality data in ambient waters. So that means we're not doing you know, end of pipe permit compliance monitoring. Rather, we go out into the watershed and we look at either water, uh, sediment quality, habitat, or even biota. And we mostly sample in creeks, streams, and rivers. And true, we haven't been to every stream on this map yet. I hope you'll see by the yellow dots that swamp teams have sampled in most major systems throughout the region. As we talked about today, and in fact, Jay just really highlighted the value of how scientific information is communicated to the public really uh, has a huge effect on whether the public even gets the information and what they interpret from it. So recently, Swamp has shifted to using more digestible formats like fact sheets and report cards and interactive platforms. And it's obvious here today that the RMP, it just really excels in how it synthesizes complex data so just my kudos to RMP staff uh, that write the polls and annual updates. Well, my next few slides here are gonna highlight some recent swamp monitoring studies. So following the 2017 North Bay fires, the environmental community was very concerned about impacts to water quality. So in response, we created an emergency post-fire monitoring plan in collaboration with the North Coast Water Board. We collected nutrients, PAHs, and heavy metals because of the increase in these contaminations were observed in other fires 
in Southern California and because they can be detrimental to human health or toxic to wildlife. And the good news, which I shared in detail in a past RMP talk, was that we did not find evidence of water contamination despite the substantial damage from the fires. Another study we conducted recently was a five-year study looking at bacteria levels in the Petaluma watershed. Uh, this study focused on both the main stem and a number of tributary sites shown in this map in red. The crew spent 60 sampling days in the field, uh, looking at the magnitude, seasonality, and locations of pathogen impairment. Uh, analytes included fecal indicator bacteria, as well as a newer method called microbial source tracking, which can identify if fecal matter is coming from humans, cows, dogs, or horses. These data were the backbone of the TMDL impairment assessment and source identification, and will serve as a baseline for future monitoring. In 2018, our regional water board adopted the Pescadero Creek sediment TMDL, which protects spawning habitat for steelhead trout and coho salmon. So we conducted a field study that involved measuring percent fine sediment, which are small sediments like sand and silt, in both stream pools and in shallow areas where salmon and steelhead lay their eggs. So we plan to resample these sites in the future to document improvement in physical habitat conditions resulting from the TMDL. And now moving to kind of more current events. Uh, this summer, we partnered with a nonprofit watershed organization called Napa Eye Care to collect bioassessment data in the Napa River watershed. Now, bioassessment is a standardized method to evaluate conditions in creeks or rivers. And the method examines water chemistry, stream physical habitat, algae composition, and the composition of benthic macroinvertebrates, which are those insects, crustaceans, and snails that live at the bottom of the creek. So the goal of this study was to compare current conditions to bioassessment data collected over 10 years ago. And two field crews busily sampled Napa River, main stem, and 20 tributaries this summer. Uh, Napa Eye Care will be publishing the findings in a report next year. So not only does Swamp collect data, as I've described in some previous slides, but we also analyze existing data on watershed or regional scales. So for example, the regional nutrient analysis will help us coordinate and prepare for the statewide biostimulatory and biointegrity provisions, which are currently being developed by the State Water Board. And the goal of this project is to provide consistent protection of human health, recreation, and aquatic life beneficial uses from anthropogenic eutrophication. The preliminary analysis has focused on total nitrogen and total phosphorus levels because these are very common analytes and associated with eutrophication. The map on the right shows total nitrogen concentration collected across two decades, and you can see a difference in concentration across watersheds that warrants further study. Now, future analyses of this will incorporate other indicators such as algae, chlorophyll A, dissolved oxygen, and physical habitat. Another swamp effort performed in collaboration with the State Water Board is the Freshwater Harmful Algae Bloom Program. Harmful algae blooms, otherwise known as HABs, can pose a risk to people and animals due to the toxins, odors, and scum they produce. The public can report suspected blooms using a web portal, and these reports are published in the online map shown on the right. And when reports come in, um, swamp staff coordinate an event response, which might involve visiting the water body to do sampling or coordinating with landowners if signs are needed to warn the public about water contact. It's important to remember that toxins produced by these blooms can be transported through these creeks and into San Francisco Bay. So that's one RMP connection. So speaking of RMP connections, now is the part of the talk where we're looking for some audience participation. So you uh, time to think about your favorite monitoring program and to share the name, 
geography, and pollutant focus with us through the Q&A function on the lower portion of your Zoom screen. So it isn't lost on this group, but the water cycle knows no bounds. So let's broaden our mental models to think about the many water body types in the Bay Area, ranging from our Pacific Ocean, to Bay Wetlands, to the Bay proper, all the way up into the upland watersheds. And in order to get our digital conversation rolling, uh, the next few slides will highlight some monitoring programs within each of these categories. So how cool would it be to have a map with all this information in one place? Well, that's the plan. So uh, send in your information and we'll help make that a reality. So first, my apologies for using acronyms, but there's limited real estate on these slides. So for this one, uh, we're gonna look at all the upland sites like watersheds, creeks, rivers, and lake studies and programs. So starting in the North Bay, we have a number of county stormwater programs that are monitoring for stormwater pollutants uh, according to requirements and stormwater permits or to manage valuable resources in uh, city or county bounds. Um, also, sometimes our nonprofit groups can partner with others or collect data on their own. And one study to highlight is a collaboration between Sonoma Ecology Center and the Sonoma County Stormwater Program that was looking at bacteria and pesticide information in Sonoma Creek and Petaluma watersheds. Another organization that most of you are familiar with um, but has been renamed recently is the Bay Area Municipal Stormwater Collaborative, formerly known as BASMA, and they coordinate monitoring across the municipal regional stormwater permit. Um, you know, uh, uh, another group that collects a lot of data are, uh, are open space districts. And this is actually a place where I think we could really use some of your information today. Uh, because there's so many uh, specialized studies that are happening on those properties, and we may not be, we really want to share the information about what's happening. So uh, for East Bay Regional Parks or Mid Peninsula Open Space District, you know, tell us about some of your, your greatest watershed studies or especially ongoing work that you have in those lands. The DPR, Department of Pesticide Regulation, has a surface water protection program the samples for pesticides and urban waterways. And our flood control districts also collect valuable data. Uh, for example, Zone 7 recently conducted a nutrient bioassessment and fish study survey. Our reservoir owners and operators also collect a lot of data on the lakes and reservoirs themselves, but also on the upper watersheds for the streams and creeks that flow into the reservoirs. Uh, SFPUC and Valley Water um, collect a lot of information. And um, so please share other, other studies coming from those properties. So just a reminder to click on the Q&A button in the Zoom tool to give us uh, your suggestions on great monitoring programs in these watershed areas. All right. Now, going down the hydrologic cycle, we're moving to wetlands. Uh, within our Bay Wetlands, the Wetland RMP is a new player, and it is currently in the process of identifying long-term funding that will be collaboratively managed by SFEI and the San Francisco Estuary Partnership. So the Wetland RMP will be establishing long-term monitoring sites and protocols to track wetland conditions throughout the Bay. Another um, program that collects data are the Resource Conservation Districts and one that uh, collects a lot of data is the Sassoon Marsh RCD. Uh, they're looking at dissolved oxygen in sloughs. Uh, I'd be remiss not to mention the nutrient management strategy, which was greatly discussed by Derek uh, Roberts earlier today. So you've heard a lot about the focus of that program. The South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project is another uh, collaborative effort that collects a, a wide range of wildlife and habitat parameters. And our uh, wastewater agencies directly fund research on bay wetland habitats and fish populations in the lower South Bay. So um, 
now is a chance to think about other wetland monitoring programs, uh, such as the National Estuarine Research Reserve or other landowners that are uh, have continuous monitoring or long-term monitoring sites, then please add them to the Q&A. Well, as has been said many times in this meeting, we are lucky to have all these well-established programs in San Francisco Bay. Uh, highlight just a couple here. The Interagency Ecological Program monitors uh, throughout the Bay and Delta. As mentioned earlier in this talk, the dredging community uh, conducts some sampling for dredging projects and is largely focused on sediment quality issues. So to encourage beneficial reuse of those sediments. The Bay RMP is the glue that connects all these various studies together. And the USGS uh, collects a variety of ship-based water quality measurements, as you heard in Melissa's talk, uh, and also deploys continuous monitoring sessions, uh, sorry, sensors in many portions of the Bay. And you heard about that suspended sediment monitoring earlier today as well. And our Pacific Coast benefits from two statewide sampling programs. One is the Swamp Coastal Fish Study, where they look at fish tissue to determine which species are safe to eat. Uh, we also benefit from the statewide Beach Watch Program, which includes a county uh, environmental health programs that collect indicator bacteria data to ensure that our large public beaches are safe for swimming and recreation. So there are even other monitoring programs to consider, like federal ones that happen to um, come through the Bay uh, or come through the state. And some of those are the EPA National Aquatic Resource Survey or NARS. Uh, also the USGS supports stream-based monitoring under the National Water Quality Assessment Program known as NACWA. And of course, monitoring from the Delta RMP can tell us a lot about water quality um, as it's flowing into the Bay. And last, to make informed decisions about water, we realize we use a lot of common data sources, such as the ABAG land use layers or National Weather Service data, uh, our USGS and flood control and private sector stream gauge data. So if you use a, one of those data layers or other data layers that are publicly available, please tell us about them in the Q&A. Um, so we can pull a list of those together as fabulous resources. And when we put it all together, the map starts to look full, but there's still plenty of room for your input. And thanks to SFEI for compiling all this great information. So monitoring takes a team and this photo recognizes the hard work and effort of past swamp uh, staff. And it, I'm so happy to hear Karen's on the call because you'll recognize Karen Taberski in this photo montage, um, who's an RMP enthusiast. Uh, also, I wanted to, to really recognize uh, current water board staff, Christina Yoshida and Rebecca Nordenholt, who created a, a number of the slides that you saw today. And this photo also shows uh, a number of our watershed steward program members, scientific aides and contractors who built the regional swamp program into what it is today. So thanks for sharing your time with me. And if I have time for questions, I will answer them, but we might wanna to move to the next session. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Thank you a lot. Uh, well, we, we, we don't, we actually have uh, three, not questions, but uh, information on, on additional monitoring. But we, we don't really, the intent was not to, to uh, Call attention to all of them. That anyway, it's just to kind of start this ball rolling, and uh, and we're going to welcome further input either through the rest of the meeting and actually after the meeting it, as this effort matures and we will build as this as Kevin alluded to this cool map and keep it up to date. And I can imagine over time it could even make it interactive so you can see like point and click sort of so what's going on. And so that, that would, that's our hope, but this is, this is a good start. Oh yeah, we really do need, we are, 
uh, like five minutes past schedule and I want to give our next panel a sufficient time and, and not have our whole audience uh, stay on late past our expected closure at four. So thank you, Kevin. And let's give them a virtual clap as with, you know. Yeah. Thank you. So let's move on. Uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, uh, Ann Cooper Doherty from the Department of Toxic Substance Control, who is a key player in their Safer Consumer Products program, is part of our panel. But before we engage the panel, Ann Cooper is going to give us an overview of the Safer Consumer Product program. Just briefly, uh, Ann Cooper is, as I noted, she's like a, a key player in, in that program at DTSC, excuse me, I didn't have, I moved. Uh, she's a senior environmental specialist. Uh, she in particular, she's been working, uh, she's leading the work on the, the program's efforts on zinc, six PPD, PPD that Kelly Moran alluded to, as well as uh, one for dioxane uh, in personal care and cleaning products. And she's in participating and interested in numerous other things. And I'm going to leave let that to you and Cooper to call attention to the other things that you're attending to or would attend to that the RMP could help you with. So with that, why don't you uh, take over the screen and uh, give us your overview of the program. Thanks. I think, um, Kevin, you'll have to stop sharing for it to allow me to share. There you go. Does that work? Yep. All right, great. Um, okay, um, so there we go. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I just wanted to give a brief overview of the Safer Consumer Products Program in terms of how it works, um, and then give a little case study on just one example of how we've used the RMP data. So the Safer Consumer Products Framework is essentially four different steps, and I'll walk through each of them in a little bit more detail. So the first is our candidate chemical list. So this is a list um, of chemicals of, that have been listed as of concern by authoritative bodies. And this comes from 23 other authoritative lists, lists that we reference. Um, the chemicals on this list can be specific chemicals like 6PPD, as we've talked about. Um, they can also be really large classes like PFASs, which you've also heard a lot about today. Um, so it can range, but it numbers in the thousands. Um, PFASs alone, I think, puts it there. Um, but this is essentially the menu of chemicals that we can pick from to potentially regulate. So the next step is the product chemical combinations evaluation that may cause harm. Um, so the menu of products that we can potentially regulate comes from our priority product work plan. So each three, each, um, three years we issue a new work plan. Uh, the most recent one notably uh, added a product category of motor vehicle tires that also place an emphasis on products that may generate uh, microplastics. So notably in this step, what we're doing is we're evaluating and prioritizing chemicals in the context of products. Um, so to do that, we consider the potential for exposure to the chemical from the product, as well as um, the potential for significant or widespread harm from that exposure. Uh, the key emphasis here is potential. Our bar is fairly low compared to a lot of other regulatory um, agencies. So once we prioritize a product chemical combination, we list it through rulemaking, at which point it becomes a priority product. Um, and then we move on to our third step, and that's our alternatives analysis step, our AA. Um, so in most cases, each manufacturer that produces that priority product and sells it in California must then conduct an AA, and that's a life cycle evaluation of the chemical in the product. They're comparing pays possible alternatives, they're using their own knowledge and values to decide on which alternatives might be best. And the goal here, of course, is to uh, prevent regrettable substitutes that may pose harm later on. So those AAs are submitted. We post them online for everyone to see. And then we move to our fourth step, and that's the regulatory response step. Um, at that point, DTSC has a wide range of possible actions that we can use to protect public health or the environment. Um, so we propose those on a per responsible entity basis. Those would, of course, also be available for public comment. Um, and this is, again, why, you know, the word potential is important here because we're not necessarily banning um, things. There are a number of different responses that we can take. 
Um, there might be a no response if we think that the manufacturer is um, adequately assessed alternatives and they're adopting a safer alternative. We can request additional information to DTSC or require additional information to DTSC or consumers, additional safety measures. We can restrict the sale um, and prohibit the sale of uh, the product. We can also um, require end-of-life product stewardship as well as research funding. Um, so this is a you know important end to our process. We haven't quite gotten there yet. We're still a fairly new program, um, but this is the the last and final step. So then I just wanted to give a brief overview of a case study of how we've used six, uh, uh, RMP data, uh, six PPD, which Kelly did a great job of setting up for me. So I don't have to spend quite as much time there. Um, but as Kelly mentioned, six PPD is an anti degradant used in um, all motor vehicle tires, as far as we know and it prevents the cracking of rubber. The image in the top right is two pieces of rubber with and without um, anti-degradant. The one on the right does not contain the anti-degradant. I think we can all um, agree that we don't want our tires to look like the cracked one on the right. So um, a reaction product of 6-PPD, 6-PPD quinone, uh, has been discovered by researchers in Washington to be acutely toxic to coho salmon. It kills them in a matter of hours. Um, it's pretty graphic and alarming to see. So all this research um, has been going on for years and it culminated in the release of a paper by Tianadal at the end of last year. Um, and from that, we worked, have been working at record speed for our program. Um, and we actually released a technical document and proposed motor vehicle tires containing 6PPD as a priority product this summer in June. Um, partially because we wanted to ensure that our process would be used when um, tire manufacturers are evaluating alternatives to prevent regrettable substitutes. And I think one of the only reasons that we were able to move as fast as we were and actually proceed with this and remain relevant in this really big alarming story is because of data from the RMP showing the presence of 6-PPD quinone in the San Francisco Bay Area and concentrations above the LC50. As a part of our program, we have to show, you know, the, our bar is fairly low, so there is potential, but we do have to show potential for exposure and potential for adverse impacts. And given that most of the data, you know, at that point was in, is, our, is in Washington, we really had to make the case that there's concern here in California. And I don't think that we could have done that without this RMP data um, showing these concentrations, these elevated concentrations. So that is just one example of how we've used the RMP data, and I look forward to talking about it a bit more in the discussion to follow. Thanks so much. Hey, great. Thank you, Ann Cooper. And I should have mentioned that you are a, an active participant in the Emerging Contaminant Work Group of the RP, and where there's this ob obvious nexus is, is ever growing. So thank you. So now, uh, so I'm going to convene the panel. Uh, they're primed, ready to go. And I'm going to jump right in because I've got a couple, some questions queued up for them regarding uh, use of RMP data for decision making. So the, the first question is a, is a twofer that I'm going to ask, I'm asking them is that for each to give an example of how their sector, now, uh, my, excuse me, before I do that, I, I, I am remiss. I need to uh, let you know who they are. The panelists are Maureen Dunn from Chevron who represents the industrial uh, sector. And then we have James Downing from Valley Water, who represents the, the stormwater sector, municipal stormwater sector. John Coleman from the Bay Planning Coalition, who represents the dredging sector. And Lorian Fono from the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, which represents the municipal wastewater sector. When I say sector in part, these are the, the sectors that fund the RNP. These sectors all pay fees to the RNP. So they represent the, the, that group. And then we have Ann Cooper Doherty from DTSC in our panel. All right, so panelists, question is, give, what is an example of how your sector has used or benefit, benefit from RMP data to inform a management action or decision? And can you give an example of uh, another, uh, of what the RMP could do to inform another management action or decision? Start, let's start with Maureen. Sure. Um, so, so we rely on the RMP greatly um, uh, as industrial dischargers. We have NPDES permits, and so you know, just talking about the basics of NPDES permitting, 
you look at your receiving water and the health of that receiving water, and you look at the discharge that you're trying to get a permit for. And so when the water board is putting together their permit, they look at, uh, is the receiving water meeting water quality objectives? And they base that on all of the background data that the RMP collects. So we really rely on the RMP to provide uh, reliable and consistent data for that background um, data for our permits so that we know whether our discharge will be affecting the water quality. Good. Uh, James? Sorry, trying to get myself off mute here. Um, so uh, if you were uh, paying attention during the previous session on stormwater, uh, you will recognize uh, some of what I'm going to say as redundant uh, because uh, they did a really good job in that session of um, pulling out some great examples of how the stormwater sector uses uh, RMP data to really streamline and make efficient uh, the things that they need to do uh, under their permit. And um, a great example of that is um, the work that's been done around modeling and um, sampling uh, uh, during storms uh, to try and find uh, source properties or source areas, rather, sub-watersheds, where uh, it might be um, fruitful to look for source properties. And uh, without that kind of work, uh, it is would be a lot more like looking for needles in a haystack. And so with the limited funds that are available through stormwater programs, uh, that is hugely valuable. Uh, and so across the last seven years or so, where uh, Lester and Alicia and their team of intrepid uh, storm chasers has gone out and, uh, in the middle of the night and taken water samples from uh, storm drains all across, all around the Bay Area, um, we have gained a lot of information that has really allowed us to focus our limited resources on the most um, promising areas for uh, finding PCBs in, in particular. And um, I'm really looking forward to, to um, the things that are coming down the line on um, all the uh, modeling efforts that are being developed now, the uh, update of the regional spreadsheet model and uh, others that will help us use existing data and data that will be collected in the near future to do even more of that. So um, I have been kind of a, an RMP lurker, I guess you'd say, for many years. And in fact, um, Back in the early early 90s, I when I was in grad school at Moss Landing Marine Labs, I was one of the ones collecting some of those early fish uh, for Karen Taberski and uh, her uh, efforts to use the Bay Protection and Toxic Cleanup Program to augment the RMP. And uh, it turned out uh, really well. And uh, through that whole time, I have been impressed by the, um, by the, how much the RMP can produce with such limited funding and resources. And I think maybe one of the biggest and best things that has come out of the RMP has been its ability to communicate that information to the public in a way that is uh, accessible and, um, and easy to understand. And that goes a long way toward um, helping our elected officials and public understand why it's so important to do the monitoring that the RMP does. Thank you, James. And actually you're reminding me of something very important and how the RMP affects academia. And we have a lot of partnership with academia and as a result, uh, we're, we're inspiring students, obviously like you to uh, pursue a career, uh, environmental career in the Bay Area and uh, with a nexus to the RMP, great. Uh, next, Lorian. Hey, thanks, Tom. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. 
So in our region, municipal wastewater agencies have the option to conduct their own receiving water monitoring, or they can contribute to the RMP. And they have unanimously selected the latter. So the first benefit of this regional approach, we summarize every year in a compliance letter to the water board, um, and we show how the RMP supports actions required by our permits, including the mercury and PCB watershed permit, cyanide action plan, copper action plan, nutrient science that's uh, required by the nutrient watershed permit. The RMP contributes to that as well. Selenium TMDL support. And so what you see in other um, regions, individual agencies are responsible for their own receiving water monitoring. They don't have the advantage of data QA. They don't have the analysis that is provided by the RMP and they don't have the synthesis that's brought by the RMP. So besides that fundamental baseline uh, compliance work that the RMP collaborates with us on. They've worked with BACWA on special studies. Uh, for example, uh, they worked to measure enterococcus background concentrations in the Bay, which then allowed uh, enterococcus limits to be calculated in incorporating dilution so that the effluent limits didn't have to be as conservative as they would have been otherwise. Uh, the RMP is also collaborating with BACWA on the PFAS special study that Miguel spoke about earlier this morning so that we can leverage uh, their expert uh, expertise and other PFAS work that they're doing in other compartments so that we can understand PFAS in a regional context, not just as data points that are dropped into a state database. And then beyond helping to meet permit requirements, the RMPCC work informs actions that are developed by the Bay Area Pollution Prevention Group, which is a committee of BACWA. Um, and so what they use that data for is next steps on determining whether correct action is public outreach or regulatory advocacy for pollutants um, that are assigned to moderate concern on the tiered risk framework. So in the future, we're looking forward to increased collaboration with the RMP on turning science into action. Thank you, Lorian. Uh, uh, next, John. Great, thank you, Tom. I'd like to thank SFEI for the opportunity to be able to talk about this. Representing the dredgers, uh, there's some people out there who believe dredging is not good for the environment. The fact of the matter is it's critical to the environment and to the economy of the Bay Area. And the RMP process has allowed us to really work in a candid manner with discussions between regulators and those being regulated, whether it be wastewater or dischargers or whatever the case, to work through problems and solution and to try and find a solution. And to have the regulated community and those being regulated working together, sitting at the table cannot be minimized. It is critical to being able to move forward on projects. And so a lot of credit needs to be given to SFEI and RMP for doing just that. I mean, we're, we're looking at sediment, that's our issue. We want to move the sediment out of the bay so the ships can go in and out safely and so there's no spills. And that sediment can and should be used for beneficial reuse. And really, that is an economic and environmental benefit to the Bay Area and our region. And people need to look at that for exactly what it is. Um, and by taking the regional approach to do studies, we, as was talked about a few minutes ago, reduces the cost on everybody. And everybody's working from the same level. It's, it's very technical and uh, it allows a lot of work to be done. It is our hope that going forward that the, with RMP, that the data synthesis projects that are, uh, will be allow for the restoration of actually more uh, dredged material sediment to beneficially reused. What we wanna see is actually more of the sediment reused for beneficial reuse, shoreline resiliency, because quite frankly, we're running out of time, folks, in the Bay Area with sea level rise and dredge sediment is gonna play a critical role to protecting our environment and our economic resources. Thank you, John. Uh, and Cooper? Yeah, thanks. So um, for us, I think, you know, I've already talked about 6PPD, but RMP data has actually been used in technical documents that we've put out to support priority products. Um, and a number of other cases, the nonalphenolic oxalates and laundry detergents, uh, flame retardants and children's sleep products, um, three different priority products related to P PFASs, uh, carpets and rugs, treatments and food packaging. Um, so we've heavily relied on RMP data just to date um, in terms of the things that we've already started working on. 
Um, and it's already been also been really supportive in terms of advancing our understanding of other chemicals that we're starting to research, um, such as the other chemicals associated with tires um, that might be of concern that Kelly alluded to today. And Becky actually came and presented at a workshop that we held this summer on the topic. And um, I think almost every chemical that we asked about, she had data um, from the RP to present on to support the questions that we had about um, the concern for these other um, chemical additives and tires that we were researching. I also think the RMP has been really innovative in advancing the understanding of contaminants in the aquatic environment. The, the conceptual models that um, Diana and Kelly both presented on today, um, just really kind of helping people get a better understanding of how consumer products can contaminate the aquatic environment. And um, that's particularly important for us while we're trying to figure out, you know, we look at chemical in a product and are trying to figure out what might be exposed and what the potential harm might be. Um, and it's really important to do that to understand how it could get into the aquatic environment. Um, and advancing that has been really important. Um, Kelly actually presented on um, the tire wear particle work that she uh, presented on earlier today at our workshop this summer as well, that really helped um, serve as the basis for the understanding of why you know, a chemical in tires is actually a concern for the aquatic environment. Um, so I think that's some of the highlights, but we've um, certainly benefited a lot from the great work going on at the RMP. Well, thank you. So the panelists have told us what uh, the RMP has or can do for them. I'm now going to ask them, what can they do to help the RMP? So, so with that in mind, I'm going to ask the panelists to, uh, to tell us, what could they do to help you know, enhance the RMP's ability to inform management questions or decisions? And uh, I'll start with Lorian. Sure. So the BACWA community has always been very enthusiastic about participating in and providing in-kind support to the emerging contaminants uh, group through the RMP, but um, we're thinking beyond that into a, helping to sustain a long-term emerging contaminants program. Back in 2016, we worked with the Water Board to develop an order where POTWs had the option to reduce monitoring of traditional constituents where the, that data was of low value, either because the data was consist consistently non-detect or because it wasn't changing over time. And so those cost savings were translated to funding for RMP special studies. So right now we're working with the Water Board to make those low value monitoring reductions permanent and earmark the savings for CEC's projects. So the emerging contaminants group has a dependable and sustainable long-term funding source. And so this overall vision is to transfer resources for monitoring the pollutants that were of concern in the previous decades um, to making an investment in better understanding emerging pollutants so that we can take action before they become of high concern. Thank you, Lorraine. I can take, thank you much and I, for the audience sake. The, those additional fund that the BACWA contributes, the BACWA agency contribute to the RP, practically triples the resources available for our CEC work. Major benefit. Uh, so uh, next up, John. Great, thank you, Tom. Well, it should be noted that this year, the dredging community actually increased the amount of funding towards the RMP and appreciate the uh, RMP working with us during the a period when the economy was less stable and we weren't sure where things would, would land. So we appreciate that. I think really when it gets right down to it, what we wanna see is um, what we hope is more funding comes in. We're ready to work with the RMP and all its partners to help secure funding on the federal and state level to do more monitoring, uh, in order to collect more data. That data is important for us from a standpoint of sediment, uh, monitoring, and we will also help more in terms of as necessary with the RMP sediment and steering groups that we're already involved with, but we're ready to jump both feet in and make the RMP more effective on what your charge is. We believe in it, and we're here to assist and help, but we want to make sure that, you know, as does every group who's on this panel, that we're getting the studies that we need, that we need in order to be able to promote our issues and causes for the regional bodies. Thank you, John. Maureen. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to agree with a lot of what John said um, because some of the industrial dischargers are also dredgers. So, um, you know, we, we definitely would work to 
help with funding on the federal level. Um, and we fully support the RMP and the reliability of the data, the unbiasedness of the data. Um, I think that's really important to all of us. Um, and I think we could get a little bit more involved in the uh, working group meetings. Um, I think we, you know, industrial dischargers have kind of had a little backseat for some time, but um, it's, it's still something that we value greatly. Um, and I really appreciate also the, the type of studies that were discussed, like the, the fish study, trying to find out are people using fish for sustenance fishing and how would that affect um, water quality objectives? You know, I mean, that would make a big difference in our discharge permits if, um, if we learned that more people were using fishing for their main diet in the Bay. So um, I think just more, more contribution to the working groups, continuing funding and working on getting more funding. Yeah. <laughs> more money, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I just quickly, I'd live there because we've, uh, the, the R&P overall budget is a, approximately $4 million a year. And we do quite a bit with that, but we could do a lot more. We're, we're constrained on how, how deep or wide we can go in some of our studies and even a lot to do in terms of emerging contaminants and microplastics, uh, as pointed out, a lot more than we can afford to do in to a better inform our understanding of sediment fate and transport and the ever increasing demand for information to help us uh, be resilient and to sea level rise and other climate change stuff. So we're, there's some hope that, that we'll find some ad additional sources, but we really, uh, we're so fortunate that we do have a very solid base. Uh, so I don't wanna put, take any wind out of yourself, James, you're next. Um, <clears throat> what wind is left, I suppose, at this uh, time of the day. Um, I, I think I should probably just echo what others have said, and that is that um, there's probably an opportunity for us to con contribute and participate more directly in the RMP. Uh, we, no one knows better than you, Tom, what a herd of cats, the uh, all of us um, stormwater permittees are. And um, it's because there are so many of us, it is appropriate for, um, and, and because most of us don't have uh, staff scientists, it's, it's appropriate for us to be represented by consultants at the RMP. Um, but having said that, I think there's a lot of value in participating directly because it, um, it brings a, an on the ground perspective to the discussion process that might not otherwise be had. And so uh, I think that uh, even though we might not have the capacity or the wherewithal or the understanding to um, participate in a, in a frequent technical way, I think that there is probably an opportunity for us to partic participate more frequently, uh, but occasionally. Um, when decisions are made and, and along the decision-making process. So um, I think that's, that's probably the, the thing that would be of most value for the stormwater community to offer. Yeah, well, thank you, James. And yes, I, I really hear what you're saying, but I really welcome what you're suggesting, even if it's uh, uh, li limited, uh, but uh, some additional participation by actual municipal players would help. Uh, you know, knowing they're all resource challenges. So I, I like the song that you're, you're writing. So thank you. So, Ann Cooper. Yeah, I think I'll just um, follow up to say, I think for us, continued engagement with the RMP, both through um, the work group meetings, as well as just direct meetings with staff to help sh make sure that it's clear about um, what our priorities are and what our data needs are in terms of our ability to move forward on some of these chemicals that we're concerned about. Um, so I think that's probably the number one thing. Um, and also just kind of the networking and awareness of others, particularly with this XPPD topic, we've come in touch with so many different people that have questions um, or maybe opportunities for research that um, we can continue to try and network and connect those with folks at the RMP to help try and answer those questions. So that's about it. Yeah, well, 
Thanks. I mean, I, we know what you just said. It's just part of a uh, in, increasing dialogue that we're having. It's like it's like how we can. Uh, we always want to do what we can to help your program effort. And there's a two way there's a two way communication. And I, and I actually I, I'm personally aware of how much communication does go on like between you and Kelly and Diane and, and, and other and other parts of your team. So. Let's keep it going. Thank you very much. That's well, uh, we don't have any questions for the audience. Uh, there was a specific, uh, relative to this, and it's probably good because my clock on my computer says it's 3.59. And uh, I, I think regardless, we uh, mission accomplished for this panel because we wanted to give the audience a, a sense of like really how much interaction there is between uh, management needs and, and the science uh, needs for science and the science generated by the regional modern program. They're, they're not independent. They're very much inter interrelated and building a little bit of off of uh, you know, what James said, our work groups aren't all scientists. They are, it's, it's important to have stakeholder in, interests that aren't necessarily scientists there to make sure the, helping the scientists who are engaged to understand what really is happening or in the real world of, uh, of the folks who are, of, who are affected by water quality in the Bay and, and regulatory actions. So uh, I guess one of the big, the a significant part of our RMP model is the continuous integration and communication between managers and scientists and everything in between. Um, I'm very challenged to to think of any other anything else anybody any other form that does better than we do. So, I think this this panel just kind of illustrated that to an extent. So, and um, and each year when we do our annual meetings, we we try to emphasize that we don't just generate science for the hope that it'll be used. We really uh, put put our attention towards applied science and uh, informing decisions. And we're we've got an ever growing number of notches in our belt. So thank you all panelists. Thank you all in the audience who are participants in the Regional Monitoring Program and help it be as good as it can be. I also want to thank all of the, the moderators and presenters today to, who contributed to yet another great day for water quality in San Francisco Bay when we, uh, we, we get together like this and share our knowledge that inspires us all to do more better and do more better together, which is a very important part of this. Uh, of this. So uh, in closing, uh, a couple of key things. Um, uh, just want to remind you that next year's meeting is scheduled for October 13. It will, it, at this point, it's where we're intending it to be an in-person meeting at the Brower Center again in, in Berkeley. I, but uh, we will, it will, we'll have a, a means though that people can at least not necessarily interactively attend remotely, but they basically can uh, observe the meeting remotely. And we'll, we'll see what the technology allows us for, for in, that, in that context. Clearly the benefit of remote participation is huge given the number of people who participate today compared to the cap of what we can entertain at the, uh, at the center. But that said, it's really good to be in, to work, have these meetings in person because there's a lot of interaction that goes on during the breaks. And, and then very importantly, which we're not able to do tonight is that we, we have a social hour or two after the annual meeting, which uh, always has good dialogue and good vibes. So we'll just have to do that virtually, think, think good thoughts about each other and what we've learned to date and how much more we're gonna learn through our wonderful r and p and 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 think about you know those that that not so dirty discharge to the bay that might occur tonight and um, and think positive about that and uh, last and very importantly is uh, is please please fill out the survey it helps us uh, recognize what works what we could do better and uh, Jay Wright, you just nod your head. I'd say everybody who's registered will get an, soon get an email with a relatively user-friendly, I'm gonna say a user-friendly survey. 
please fill it out. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all so much. Go Giants. <laughs>